So a couple of weeks ago, I had the amazing opportunity to have the man himself, Eduardo Pavez Goye, do an extensive interview here on the channel. And I am going to be shooting the Minolta X700. So, Ed, what's up, dude? Ah, hold on. I'm dying. <laughs> okay, I'm good now. <laughs> what's up, Ed? How you doing, man? All good, all good. Here I am. All right. In the middle of the morning. <laughs> so, I asked you to be on here uh, in part of kind of like a new video series talking just about street photography. And just to be completely transparent with you, I think you were the person who really got me into street photography. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I think a couple of years back, you made like a Canon A1 video shooting some Agfa black and white film. Do you remember that video? Yeah, I was. I, that was, I think, my first video shooting on the street in Berlin, actually. Was it? Yeah, it was there my first go. video. Yeah. So I, I watched oh my that. God. Yeah. That's super OG, man. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I guess we're going to be talking about street photography. But first, let's get an intro from you. Uh, how are you doing, man? Are you working on any projects or anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, right now, at this very moment, I am one week away from handing out my thesis for my MA because I'm making a PhD in Colombia in, in theater and performance. Oh, so I'm one week away from delivering my, my, my first year MA thesis. Yeah. And I have to, the next two weeks, I'll be writing and I'll be writing a new paper and rewriting another paper that I have to hand out. So I have a bunch of writing and theoretical stuff that I have to do for the four show, for the four coming weeks. But after that, I'm just, I have to finish a couple uh, scripts and I'm thinking of doing more stuff for the channel now that, you know, there's nice weather outside and I'm going to have time, which are two assets that a few <laughs> weeks ago I didn't have. Yeah, so for sure. I'm excited for that. I'm excited for having some time and having the ability to go outside without feeling guilty of, oh man, maybe I should be studying instead of, you know, taking yeah. images. <laughs> I've been experiencing it. that for months. <laughs> Dude, hey, good luck with that. Thanks, man. Good luck, good luck with that. So, um, what what I've done, like, to the kind of format for this thing here is uh, I've asked people on Instagram for questions related to street photography. Um, and I guess what we'll do is we'll kind of just run through it and we'll find, like, a certain theme that goes through. Cool. Uh, and the first one being from Rick underscore street film. Like, I've known... Like, just following your YouTube channel for the last, I think, two years, I, I've seen you move from different places and kind of travel. So you've been in Berlin. Mm -hmm. You also, uh, you know, occasionally went back home to, was it Chile, right? Yeah. And then you also, like, went to Japan. You did, like, a whole Japan thing. And then yeah. you went to New York City. That's where you're at right now? Yeah, I was in, in between. I was in London and then I was in Hastings. And Hastings. at the beginning, I was in Cologne, but there's no, there's no video of that, so I was never there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it starts in Berlin, but yeah, yeah. And now I'm now I'm here. I also I have also been to Mexico City a bunch of times in the in the Mexico meantime. Mexico City, dude. Yeah. So you've been a lot of places. Um, the question from this guy was that: Do you think changing location, city or country, can improve your photography? What are your thoughts on that? We, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I mean, it's complex because it depends on what you mean by improve the photography. Because, for example, taking pictures in Hastings is completely different from taking pictures in New York or taking pictures in Tokyo. So it's the experience is different. So if by improving the the underlying meaning is having a, a broader 
um, dynamic range of experiences in order to build some kind of image crafting, then yeah, it could improve. But I don't think you need to move around to actually develop a better photography in another terms. Like for example, to be more comfortable with your tools or to have a better understanding of how people in a certain community work. Because mm -hmm. that's, one, that's one thing that I've been struggling a lot with. When I was in Hastings, I got very accustomed to the way in which people communicate and the, the codes that people had in Hastings. Mm -hmm. So I could come over to a stranger and like, hey, what's up? Blah, 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 boom, take a picture or like trick yeah. people into, oh, let's do this and then snap a picture. Like a trick is a very bad word, but like <laughs> make it like kind of a game or I don't know. I, yeah. I was very I was very in, in sync with the vibe of Hastings. And then because mm. I've never lived in a small city and Hastings was less than 100,000 people. So before wow. that, the smallest city I've ever lived was Berlin. So I... To me, moving from a city or, or, or knowing the difference between Mexico City, which is like 28 million people and Hastings, like it's so radical <laughs> yeah, that when I moved sure. here to New York, I, I found myself unable to communicate with people in the way that I was doing it in Hastings. So I've been, I've been really struggling with feeling this uncomfortableness that comes with being like, I'm in this environment now. I have to behave in a different way now. And people receive me in a different way. Yeah. And this is, I, I, I'm sorry if the answer is too long, but it, no, no, it, no, it, it also, oh, cool. <laughs> it also, it's related to, there's a, there's a proprioception in the act of taking pictures, which is not trivial. So for example, when I was in Hastings, I was one of the very few people who had an accent who was clearly not from there. Because it's a small town in the middle of, England, you know, and it's like yeah. very British. So I was like, oh, this is the guy with the funny accent who's clear enough from here. But like, I was very easy to like this guy. So it was hard to be like to perceive me as a menace in any kind of way. Mm. No, like kind of smiley and, you yeah. know, trying to be friendly with the funny accent. And in here, I'm like, I'm just another, you know, Hispanic and it's filled with people like me. So I have to be able to perceive myself as I am being perceived by the, by the, by the landscape in which I'm located in. So now I have to behave in a different way because I'm perceived as the Hispanic guy who has a camera on the neck. <laughs> it's not the same as, you know, the funny dude who lives in West Hill. There's a different yeah. perspective. So I've been, I've been, it's been hard to come to terms with how I am identified from the outside. So that's, that's been my, my, my process on this trip. And I think I'm now coming to terms with it and being more comfortable in my own skin or how I am perceived, but but it's been a long process. So that's one thing. Okay, and how long have you been in uh, New York for since you moved? Not much. It's been eight months, nine months. I eight, think nine so. months. I mean, I'm, I'm about to finish my second semester, so it should be around nine or ten months. Probably, and probably nine. Nine months. And like, you just uploaded a recent video, right? Shooting, um, was it a folding camera? Yeah, it was, wait, it was this one. <laughs> I'm not prepared, but <laughs> yeah, it's this one. It's the, the, the Supericonta, Supericonta, the 530-16, which is a foldable camera that's like super funny looking. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Wee. <laughs> and I've noticed from that video when you were shooting, you did seem pretty comfortable though, like from, from everything that I've seen out there, like even the interaction with the other photographers on the street. Mm. Like you seem pretty comfortable out there, but um, the one thing that I want to ask you is like, you know, you kind of answered it in the, your response a minute ago, talking I, like, is Hastings your favorite place to photograph? Uh, or I know that you feel more comfortable there. Or like, let me ask you this question: What's okay. the hardest place you found to photograph, country or city, whatever? The hardest place. I have two answers for that. I guess. Um, I have several answers, so I'm, I'm just lying. But here, here's, here's, here's the. I, I can separate it in degrees or or kinds of difficulty. I think that's a that's a, a more useful way of presenting my answer. For example, in Mexico, I felt very comfortable taking pictures, but at the same time, there were spaces in which it was clearly more dangerous to take pictures. So in the in the center of the city, in the historic center. 
I was taking pictures at one moment. There, I have this video with the Besa L with a, with a wide lens. And I walk around the center of the city like, hey, I'm going to take some pictures. And there's a friend of mine, Ivan. He's a Mexican photographer. who's really cool. And he's like, hey, I can help you record the video. Yeah, sure. Come on, Ivan. Let's make the video. And I just bought a film over there. And we were walking around and taking some pictures and goofing and having fun. And then at one point, because I'm, fr I'm from Santiago de Chile, man. I'm, I'm very used to getting mugged or robbed or like, you know, it's dangerous is how we navigate the city over there. So I'm used to that. And then we were filming the video like, ah, ha, ha, yeah. And then I look around and there's a guy following us. And then we're like, okay, yeah, let's go and take pictures on this other side. And we just walk, walk, walk. And the guy's following us. And there, there's another couple of guys like following us from the other side of the street. Like these guys are going to mug us. Yeah. That, that's something that will happen. So we start navigating the, 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 the streets towards near, like, like a nearby cop who was waiting for, I don't know what. So we stood there and like making ourselves the fool, like chatting, like nothing's happening. And then the guys just left. So that was a dangerous moment, of course. Mm -hmm. But my experience in Mexico City was not always like that. But you have to know where you are. So in terms of... And, and also, there's, a, there's another episode in Mexico with the Lomo LCA in which I'm taking pictures on the street. And then I photograph one guy... And the, the image, like the video doesn't show this, but once I take the picture and then keep walking, one of the people who I take a picture of comes to me. It's like, hey, what are you doing with my picture? You're going to... And he was really aggressive. And it's something that I have never experienced before. Mm -hmm. So Mexico has that problem. Like it's very friendly. It's amazing. But I had like, the, those two experiences that I've never had anywhere else. On the other hand, uh, in London, for example, everybody is quite polite, but... Unless you're, this is true for my experience in the, the European cities I've been, they're kind of empty. So in Berlin, okay. it's really hard to take pictures of people on the street because oh. the streets are basically empty. So when you walk around, there's like a guy on the street. And even if it's really interesting, you're not going to be like the only douche on the street, like nobody around. And you take a picture of the guy, like there's no way of hiding. <laughs> So <laughs> during my trip to Berlin, it was really, really hard to take pictures. And that's the same in London, unless you're oh. in the very center, like Piccadilly Circus or, you know, the main square, like Trafalgar Square or like nearby Nelson, like touristic places full of tourists. Yeah. It's really easy for you to be the only idiot with a camera and taking pictures of other yeah. guys who are just minding their own business or like checking their phones. That's right. So that's that's really difficult. So it. I guess the long short answer is there are different degrees of difficulty and every scenario has a different kind of difficulty. And kind of, okay, first of all, that Mexico thing of that, those uh, people kind of, was it a group of guys or just one? Just one guy. Just one I guy. I mean, the one who tried to mag us was like a, a bunch of guys, like three guys, but people who got mad, it was just one guy. It was just the one guy. So on that confrontational aspect, I think that's one of the biggest questions that, you know, a lot of us get. You know, when we when we talk about street photography, how do we deal with that? Um, you know, like, can you share more on that experience? Like, how, how did it end up, like, diffusing or if it did diffuse or not? Uh, yeah, I mean, it did diffuse. The thing is, I think that it has to do with what I was saying before in regards of knowing who you are. Because when I'm taking pictures on the street, if I am not in Santiago of Chile, I am a foreign. I am not from there and people can tell I am not from there. So I can either use that for my advantage or not. So for example, in if I'm in Tokyo, I can't communicate with people. Like I, 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 yeah. I tried to study Japanese for one year when I was like 13. <laughs> so I can, I can read like if it says like the basic katakana or whatever or some hiragana, I can yeah. navigate or find the bathroom. But if somebody talks to me in the street, I can't for the life of me say anything coherent. So... Language was a barrier that would that would serve on my favor. Since I can't communicate, I have to try to be friendly. And like, if I messed up, I can try to convey, I'm so sorry. In Mexico, it's different because we speak the same language. But as soon as I speak, they're like, okay, you're Chilean. You're not a Mexican guy. Really? So they're, they're, yeah, yeah. It's, it's wow. completely different. And when I go to Argentina, it's the same. Like, of course, you're not from here. You're from Chile and you can tell because my like my Chilean accent is very thick. Oh, I mean, wow. it, can, it can be less thick when I speak in Spanish in a way, but but you can you can clearly tell if I okay, speak like, yeah. oh, yeah, you're from there. <laughs> so so when I'm when I'm in, when I was in Mexico and this thing happened, I, I had to speak in a more 
I had to neutralize my Spanish a little bit, not to sound too Chilean, but at the okay. same time, I can't sound like a Mexican. So I was like this weird thing in between. And the guy who was really angry soon realized that I was, you know, I probably was a tourist. So that gives me some kind of shield, like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know, or, hey, relax, it's just, I'm taking pictures, haha. Like, I've become really an expert of looking like an idiot. That's, that's the main <laughs> trick. That's the most important trick for street photography is you have to look like an idiot. Whenever you messed up, you're an idiot. I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, I, I was just taking like as the more idiot you look, the better, because it true. can save you from those moments. So, so I guess that that was that was it. Looking like an idiot is a really great tool, man. There you go. So looking like an idiot, huh? You know, I I think of it now, and I I think I tend to uh, upplay the word idiot when while try while I'm trying to explain something like this. Mm -hmm. but now that i think of it you're completely right like i think there's one time because I, I i don't really shoot outside of san francisco mm -hmm. mainly for the reasons that you were saying like when you're in san francisco almost everybody there that you see is a tourist so it's really easy to carry a camera around um and when you do take a photo of somebody you can act like an idiot you know oh maybe i was just taking a picture of the building i'm not from around yeah. here you know what <laughs> yeah I mean? it's like the classic where you're like Doing like this, and you see somebody, and you're like, bam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and exactly. then the people turn around, you're like, oh. and you like move the lever, like, oh. like you don't know how this thing works. Like, that's exactly. the classic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I try it, like, kind of a, uh, uh, oh, what am I saying? Um, like, I'm sorry for interrupting. <laughs> no, 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 dude. It was perfect. Like, like just yesterday, I was out photographing by um, Union Square, which is like probably you know, one of the busiest parts there for all the shopping, whatever. But, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking past this person who's maybe like a foot away from me and bring the camera to my face and dude's already going to look at me just because I already have a camera in my hand. Looks like we got a connection issue. <laughs> oh no. Reconnecting. You yeah. were saying like how to make the idiot. That was it. That was oh, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So we we're in Union Square yesterday and I was taking photographs and I think this is the first time I've ever had some, like, any type of, like, negative interaction with somebody. But, of course, I saw the dude who was right here. Looked really cool. He had, like, this really weird hat. So I'm looking at the ferry building, which you can kind of see. And I'm kind of just looking out, and I pull the camera to my face. And just, when you pulled the camera already, he already, like, he kind of, like, looked at me funny. So I took the picture. He yelled at me in a different language. I had no idea what to do. So, like, I was going to ask you this, like because you've traveled so much and you've photographed in so many other places like how do you go about trying to communicate with people who don't speak the same language because i think that's something that i'm going to struggle with um you know later down the road if i don't know how to communicate with them mm. i mean the only the only two places where that has happened was in was in tokyo and i was I, i'm in Germany, I would say, I mean, I can speak German, but my German is not good enough to get into a debate with somebody. Mm. So I could, I could read the newspaper and whatnot, but I can't like, if we disagree on, I don't know, Heidegger, I'll probably won't be able to convince <laughs> you otherwise, you know? Yeah. So, uh, when, when I can't communicate, I just use sign languages. Like I think gestures is a it's it, it can work as a certain kind of universal language as long as you convey that you're not a menace and that's for me that's the big thing because mm -hmm. it's super easy to be perceived as a menace if you have some big camera or i mean it depends on the attitude too yeah in, for in, sure. in a big way if you walk around like for example <laughs> yesterday i was i was walking around uh through through uh in new york and i don't remember exactly a street but it was like more or less downtown or midtown and i saw somebody with a big camera and was walking the street and he this person was walking and he made like uh, like a sound like <laughs> yeah you know like i'm gonna shred this shit and i'm like <laughs> that's a weird attitude to walk <laughs> around the city I, I, I wouldn't be comfortable with like no. facing somebody who's gonna you know I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. I, whenever I go outside, I try to be as friendly as possible. So I'm not perceived 
as anybody who would do any kind of damage, especially because I like taking pictures of like kids. I enjoy uh-huh. like how kids walk and, and, and have fun between um, like among themselves or like play games. And I think that yeah. it reminds me of my childhood. And I think that's a nice thing to capture. But there's a big taboo about taking pictures of children. Like you can right. be labeled as a pedophile really easily. Right. So you need to be super aware that you make eye contact with the parents and you have like a permission. Like it can be spoken or unspoken. So as long as you're not a menace and you're using like a camera that's not like it doesn't look like you're going to post pictures on Craigslist, you know? Oh, yeah. As soon as you look <laughs> legit or at least not menacing, you're good with, with I'm good with it. But that's okay. one of the, it has to do with the performance at the same time. Like your performance, a way of being, you're like a host of a show. That's how I feel. That's right. Yeah. So like, would you say there's like a, a certain like etiquette that you have while you're out there photographing? Mm. Something like that? Because like, you brought up a point very interesting about making eye contact with the parents, you know? Yeah. Um, and something that I've kind of find myself doing is I try to completely avoid eye contact. Um, mm. Maybe with the parents thing, yeah, like for sure, just so that they kind of get a sense of like, okay, this guy is like no harm. Maybe I'll smile or even just follow up with some type, uh, some type of interaction. But... For me, eye contact is one of those things that really, really scare me. Because mm. if I, the only time I'll ever make eye contact with somebody is if my eyes are looking through the viewfinder. Otherwise, I try to avoid it completely because then they'll know, like, okay, this guy's mm. taking a photo of me. You know, so how do you feel kind of about that eye contact thing? Is it an issue for you or is it more of like a, it's just whatever? No, I don't have an issue with that. Um, is there a reason why you don't want to do it? Like maybe I was. I was thinking of, is there a reason of, of like, not wanting to um, be included in the picture or to alterate the object you're taking an image of? Like, what's the, what's the reason for that? So the thing is, sometimes I do like making eye contact only through the viewfinder, though, because I, I like it when the people that I'm photographing are looking at my camera, at least. You know, to kind of have that, you know, you're, so that you're just looking straight into it. Um, it's also kind of a, not a fear of mine, but it, I just try to avoid, I, let's just say it like this. I don't make eye contact until I take the photograph. So if somebody's walking my direction, nine times out of 10, I'm still going to keep track of where they're at, but I'm looking in a different direction just so that, you know, they don't see anything of me. The only time they'll ever mm. really feel like, you know, I'm, I'm taking a photo of them is when I actually pull the camera to my face and photograph. Mm. But I guess it's just part of like um, a way for me not to be spotted or for them to feel uncomfortable. Because I, I, if I capture them when they're already just like knowing and they're looking at me, they're more tense. And it's almost like a natural. Ah, okay. So it has to do with the tension of the subject more than anything. Yeah, it makes, yeah, it makes sense in that, in that direction. Yeah. To me, to me, it depends... Yeah, it depends on the situation. There's a situation where it's it's impossible to be to go unnoticed, and if that's the case, like, uh, I mean, I don't I don't want to make it sound like it's an objective historicity of how this works. So I'm just gonna I, I can just say it on my perspective and how it's been for me. So when when I, when I started taking pictures on the street. It was more like being invisible. That was part of like my mindset. I don't want to be my I as a person don't want to be uh, infecting in any way the image that I'm trying to craft. So there was a clear fourth wall between me and the subject. And with time, because there's a limited amount of times where you can do that. Like there's there's one moment in which the person is too far away and you need to like give one or two more steps because you only have like a 35 or a 50. So it's going to look too small and you don't want to crop. And it feels like or the person is turning on their back and you want to get like their face. So you have to move one or two more steps. And you know that by doing that, the person is going to turn around and you're going to have that moment where you've been avoiding for months. Like, oh, I'm going to be the guy with the camera. I'm going to be that dude. (laughs) So... There was one moment in which I started doing that in a more active way. 
So I would, in, uh, instead of doing that moment, I would go to them and like, hey, I'm sorry for bothering you. I'm just taking this picture. Is it a problem if I do this? And the other person would be like, oh, yeah, no, no problem. It's okay. Or no, I don't feel comfortable. It depends on how you phrase it. That's another thing that I've discovered with gotcha. time. The okay. narrative that you use, it's, it's vital towards the other person's understanding of what you're going to use the picture for. Oh, okay. If you say, I'm just taking pictures or, hey, can I take your picture? That the the answer would probably be no, but if you say, "Hey, you know, I'm sorry for bothering you. You look so cool. Like you have this cool hat, and and the background it's like green, and your hat is yellow, so it goes in contrast. I don't know. It's gonna be weird, but can I take a picture of you? Because I take pictures on the street, and you look super cool. Yeah. It's very hard that the other person will say no, mm-hmm. because you explain the frame of the situation. So I would I would you I would do that sometimes. In order to say, I, I love this picture, and the other way, in which the only f- way in which I can grab it is by explaining it. So I would I would yeah, sometimes I do that. The other option would be just to make eye contact. So in order to get the permission, which is something that sometimes happens, but okay. the person who give you permission by eye contact is a very specific kind of person too. Yeah. I mean, and you can you yeah. can tell too. Like if if it's like an old grumpy guy probably it's not going to give you permission by like smiling you know <laughs> usually it's like younger people have that code of like we see each other and we know that looking at other people in the street is not a normal thing so when you get the contact it's like oh, and you show it's like okay okay there's an unspoken permission i can do it yeah. <laughs> but those two seconds were like kind of weird maybe this is like a big tangent but i was what was it the other day i was watching something some show, I can't remember what. I would love to remember, but I can't. But they they were talking about how you like when you're when you're young, <laughs> when you're really young. Yeah. And and you like somebody. Uh, like I, I don't know, I like this person in my class and uh, or on the street and I don't know what I don't know how to approach this person because yeah. whatever I do is weird. It's going to be super weird anyway. Mm-hmm. And they were saying that that weirdness never leaves. That weirdness is always already in the act of going and talk with somebody. So mm-hmm. the fact that you go and talk with somebody is assuming the risk of like that, that, um, that feeling of uncomfortableness, it's going to be there. It's, it's never going to go away. There's not a moment in which you just feel comfortable talking to other people randomly. Like That's never going to happen. But what separates the act of doing it and not doing it is the act of enduring that resistance that your own body and your own person has against that situation. Oh, okay. So that happens to me on the street when I see somebody. It's like, oh, I would like to take that picture, but uh, I'm going to... There's going to be those two, three seconds, seconds of like being super uncomfortable. Like if I like the picture enough, I'm going to go and endure those five seconds in order to make it happen but if not Mm -hmm. there's a lot of pictures i don't take on the street because ah, it's not worth it like it's not that awesome so i just leave it there i know if it happens the same to you oh yeah same thing like you kind of know when there's a photo there or you you feel it at least when you know there's something there but like you said if if it's not worth risking i kind of just i look at it and then i'm like okay never mind walk away there's a couple of uh a couple of different questions related to this the first one is from yuv jpeg and it is how do you view the frame before shooting and then another one is you know how fast does it take you to compose a photo oh those are good questions i i remember vividly when i started taking pictures i i started with a with a canon rebel xt which was the three 350 350d was the first camera i had I, i i i okay here's the long story but I feel like whenever I am in a very uh, period of my life in which I write a lot, it's hard for me to take pictures because my brain is used to thinking concepts and words and things that have to do with not the immediate, not the immediate object that I'm facing, but the thing that lies in the other layers of something like the mediation. So, for example, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I mean, that's it. Like when I'm writing, I'm thinking more of not seeing things as they are, but like, oh, what does that really mean? Does that have an underlying structure that I can, you know, whatever constructions yeah. of the head? But there are other moments in my life, 
usually when I'm on vacation or when I finish a play or when I finish a semester in the university in which my brain like kind of leaves that on the side and I can mm -hmm. focus on the immediate. Like, is this pretty or not? Does this grab my attention? Oh. And it's very easy for me to be in mindsets like, like on those boxes in, for longer yeah. periods of time. Anyway, so there are moments in which I can think more on like longer periods of, am I composing something? Is this interesting? Does this grab my attention? And mm. right now what I'm doing is I'm working heavily on theoretical stuff and words. And I have like one or two days in which I can think of images. And I, I just, I have, wow. there's an exercise of, changing the mind, at least for me, I don't know how it is for you, but to me, those things happen in separate parts of the brain. So whenever I go yeah. outside and I have to take pictures, I have to insert myself on the mindset of taking pictures. So then gotcha. when I'm in that mindset, my, and I was saying this because of the Rebel XT thing, the connection is when I started taking pictures, I was working heavily, uh, I was writing for television. I wrote for okay. television for several years there were like 500 or something episodes for That's tv awesome. so i've been doing that That's for awesome. a long time and when i was doing that i got my camera so i was like oh i wonder how this works so it was very hard for me to understand like the image function in regards to this other thing that i was doing all day but at one mm -hmm. point something clicked and what clicked for me was when i when i was able to try man there's more detours but I'm going to make another <laughs> detour, but here's the reason. I went to the Berlinale a few years ago. And in the Berlinale, there was this talk given by, I don't remember the name, but he's the photograph, the, like the, the, pho the pho director of photography from Werner Herzog. And he was giving a talk in which he talked about why it's important to shoot on film. Okay. And I was like, oh, I want to go to that talk. That sounds like on yeah. my alley. So, <laughs> so I went there and he said, the important thing about shooting in film is because it forces you to have vision. You need to know how things are going to look without looking at them. So you, have, you right. need to be able to transpose your perspective into this other future object. And I think that key is the key that happened to me when I was shooting with my, with my first digital camera. Because at one point, I was able to predict how the image was going to look once I took them. So I would use the okay. 50 millimeter and I was like, Okay, that thing is too far. That thing is too close. Oh, maybe if I take the picture like this, that background will be blurry. So there's one point yeah. in which your mind can do that translation of the media from reality to the image, which has another set of rules and functions in another way. So once you can do that, and it's usually one lens at a time. Yeah, That's why sure. people, when I have zooms, it's impossible to do that for me because I, I can't connect that. So I have <laughs> to use like, <laughs> I have to use fix focal length so I can make that translation. And, and when that moment happened to me, I was able to say, okay, now I can compose in a more confident way. Like I mm -hmm. have my 28 and I know how it's going to look. So I'm walking around the street and I know like the range of things that can happen in this space. So when I see yeah. something interesting, I know if I'm like one or two steps too far or too close or like, and for that, I don't want to sound like a fanboy or anything, but for that, the Leica has, was a great tool because since you have the distances on the top and it's really easy to focus, I could just predict the images that I was, able, I was yeah. going to be able to craft just, just from looking on the top of the, of the camera, yeah. like, okay, two meters, that's it. That regarding how to compose or how I think of composing, like once I have the camera with me, my brain is always composing how things are, are going to look once I lift the camera towards my eye. And the other thing that happens is that at one point when I was, I mean, there's several layers, but another, another of those layers is when, when I started taking pictures with the Mamiya C330, at one point, uh, since the format is square, I started thinking in square and in, in distance, which is something that I, I, was, I, I did not need to do by using other formats. So yeah. I would think of how far or close are things from the camera and how can I compose with that distance? And then that became another layer of complexity because you're not yeah. thinking of things disposed on a, on a static plane or like when, you, when you're beginning you're shooting everything with like super, like super wide open lenses. So you have one yeah. object of interest and the red is like everything's blurry and you have like yeah. that. I'm talking about this object and you have like the <laughs> face and the rest is like a blob. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, you know, that's my art. <laughs> 
Yeah, but like, <laughs> I mean, you only have one point of interest, so that's. But when you're focused or composing with formats that allow you to have more stuff on the frame, or like you have to navigate through a lot of like a dense or thick medium of possible signs. At one moment, I started thinking, for example, when I was with the camera, because the camera sits like on the chest, like here. Yeah. So it's not my perspective from my eyes. So whenever I'm walking and I see something, I would never think it from my perspective. I will have to imagine it a few centimeters down the road. So okay. you, yeah, I yeah, started yeah. composing, not only imagining how the image will look like from the perspective of the lens, but also from where the camera stands in relation to my body. How long did it take for you to get used to kind of, you know, focusing and composing with TLR? Mm, I don't, I guess I felt comfortable by the second week. I was shooting okay. every day. So by the second week, I was Got like, to. I was able to do it. And I was, I was also training myself how to focus like daily. That was another thing that I would do. So I was working on my desk and then I had like five minutes to spare and I would grab my camera and I had markings. So something is a two meter, something is a one meter, something is at 80 centimeters, and I would train my wrist. So I was like two meters, one meter, 20 centimeters, oh, two wow. meter, one meter, 20. So then when I was walking on the street and somebody came by, I was waiting until that person will be at two meters and then my wrist will make the movement automatically. So, dude, I've noticed kind of how you're, I'm, I'm starting to observe how you operate. And it all kind of <laughs> roots back to like, you are, you practice without even being out there because one of the things that I had to get over was that, you know, when I'm out shooting street, I'm not just bringing my camera and just starting to photograph. Mm. You know, I actually have to, first of all, learn the distances, kind of relate that back to the lens, and then also yeah. just practice focusing. Like, you know, that, yeah, that's too big much. for me. It's big though. That's awesome. Yeah. No. No. I would. I would. I, I grabbed this from, I have several friends who are jazz musicians and they, yeah. they practice all the time and they, they never practice big chunks of things. They always practice like small things. Like if you're playing sax, uh -huh. you would never like, you, it, there's no sense of practicing 10 scales or even one scale. You practice four notes like mm -hmm. and then yeah. and then at one point your fingers just make the notes. You don't even t need to think about it. So when you're jazzing, you're playing and everybody's like, yeah, let's go put your thing. You're like, put it. there's like one fraction, but your body just does it. It does like that, that muscle memory. You need to be able to do it. Like at least how I think about it. That's how, that's what I do with the cameras. So I train my fingers to focus. Like with my like, I would do the same. I would sit in a, by myself. And then I would train like, how far is two meters? How far is one meter? And until my fingers feel the difference. Cause, cause okay. it's like playing guitar, you know, the difference. Yeah. Or like the other thing that I used to do when I was in Chile, it was to, um, for example, and it also happened with, with the projects that I do, I choose like one ASA speed, like, okay. I don't know, 800 or whatever. And mm. then I would train myself to calculate the amount of light that there is, if there is like ASA of 800. And then I'll carry like my, my cell phone with a light meter. So then I go into a subway and I say, okay, this is probably F 1.8 at 50 seconds. And then I grab the phone and I take the measure. And if I'm right, I remember, okay, this is how this light feels. So then when I'm walking on the street and I see something and I'm not sure, and I don't have the time to take my phone out, I know more or less how it is because I've been training for a long time. So, yeah. okay, that shadow is like probably three or two steps different from the sun. So I can adjust that. But you That's train before you do that. Yeah, and the thing that I'm kind of getting from you is almost like, you know, you, you practice and focus on like the very small details. And then at the end, you know, once you've kind of done a, a lot of everything, it all goes together. Yeah. And it takes time. So like, I usually get the mm -hmm. comment on my, on my channel, like, oh, man, how do you focus so fast? Can you give me a trick? <laughs> And I'm Practice. like, there's like, I would love, man, but if, it, and it's the same if you play guitar, like, can you imagine you're playing, like, you're shredding some flamenco stuff, like, or, you know, some classic guitar, and like, oh, that's great, man. Can you give me a trick so I can do that? Like, no, you just have to sit way. with your guitar and it's a freaking boring process of moving your fingers on the fretboard. At one point, mm -hmm. you know where the notes are in the camera is the same. At one point, you know where the distances are. 
or at one point you know right. how to focus and move the the aperture at the same time like your 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 fingers can do that movement but you need to know how <laughs> to make it yeah yeah dude that's crazy because i never really thought of it as in you know kind of making that connection between music and the the jazz music how they would just practice like the very small little details but it, it's very important because you know like you said you you train your wrist to focus like who does that like i never thought i've never heard of something like that before that's crazy yeah <laughs> I, it, it was out of necessity man because it was taking me too long to focus and i was like because also i don't have it here but the mamilla the focusing on the mamilla is a <laughs> it's a big motherfucker because the <laughs> distance between infinity and like one meter is this you know it's like that's Just it of you're, yeah you're like that's infinity and then you move it here and then it becomes like one meter so you like the, you need to be super aware like okay this is I'm, I'm sure if I grab a mamilla this is gonna be like one and a half meters I know like this that's what it is yeah but I was memory. missing too many shots at the beginning. I was like, oh, here it comes. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have to train, oh, man. Yeah. You have to train yourself. So, wow, that's interesting. I never thought of it that way. Because, I, I mean, uh, okay, so here I have a question from somebody on Instagram by the name of Institute underscore 35. Mm -hmm. And their question is, uh, I know you did a video about this, but how do you learn to see interesting things? Because, you know, when you're out on the street, I think one of the hardest things about when you're first starting out, especially if you don't like have any inspiration from anybody or maybe you're this is like your first time doing it. You know, is there any kind of clear point to, you know, oh, that's something that I want to photograph or like, or are there any like key signs that you look for while you're out photographing? Uh, it, well, it depends greatly because... It's different when I'm taking pictures for myself than when I'm taking pictures for an episode. When I'm taking pictures mm. for an episode, I usually focus on things that would be specific to the place I'm taking a picture of. Uh, yeah. Because that's one of the... Very good. That, that's one of the things... I, I guess... Here's my perspective as an audience member. If I'm seeing a video of somebody taking pictures, I want to see what's special about the place where the person is taking the pictures. Otherwise, I can take mm -hmm. the same images like from my house. So if I see somebody taking pictures on a city and the person is just taking pictures of shadows or buildings, I'm like, all right. But unless the architecture <laughs> is super specific, I don't see any reason why that picture should belong to that place. Mm -hmm. So those kind of images, I, I do them or I craft them or I, I go after them if I'm not shooting an episode, like practicing composition or whatnot but I, i'm usually drawn to people so that's that's also a trick question because I, I i usually take pictures of people that's what interests me so the sub answer to that will be sometimes i take a lot of pictures and then i realize a pattern of something that is cutting my like it's it's it's, it's getting my attention more than anything so mm -hmm. i will say oh man i never realized that i like people with you know, walking towards me or like, or I'm interested in people crossing streets or I'm interested in kids in like on top of their parents. And I have a bunch of those. Oh, maybe I yeah. should go for more of that. So it's, it's one of those things where like, it's the chicken or the egg kind of problem. But at one yeah. point you make a cut and you're like, okay, I've been taking pictures of X things for a bunch of times. And now I think I should focus on that thing because I am yeah. naturally drawn to that. So I play with the things that I'm naturally drawn to that. The other option is said, oh, I've been taking pictures of X thing for so long and it's becoming my comfortable space. So it's no longer challenging me. I'm going to try this other thing. And you like actively decide to take pictures of, you know, whatever buildings. And I'm going to uh -huh. find an interesting way of presenting buildings. But those two methods are different and they have to, they have, they're connected to the way in which they're connected to the process in which you're thinking your photography. So those are two yeah. different ways. Like, kind of building off of what you were saying about photographing a pattern, when you find these patterns, they're not like already uh, instilled in your mind before you start photographing, right? It kind of just presents itself through what you're photographing. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Do you like, do you find yourself other than taking pictures of people? Like, for example, if you're taking photos of a project does that ever influence the subject matter that you 
you know, you choose while you're out photographing? I would think so. Like so far, all my projects have to do with wandering around with a specific setup in a specific place. So they are okay. very broad in terms of content. So I, instead of thinking it from the content, I think of them from the structure, like from the logical structure and not, not the interior. So I say, I'm going to use oh. this camera on this setting and whatever comes into this box, it's going to be my content. And then I fill that with content. And once mm -hmm. the box is filled with content, I can say, oh, look, I took these pictures. That happened to me uh -huh. in Japan, actually, with the scene that I made yeah. in Japan. I made a video about how to organize a scene because it was in that direction. I had a bunch of pictures about certain things and then I gave them some kind of narrative. Oh, you know, there's color and then there's black and white and then there's square format and then there's the expand. And you can see like a, a movement, like a crafting movement. But yeah, yeah. at no point I was like, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I will be like super... <laughs> I'll be super autarkic in my kind of approach. Like, whatever comes, it's going to be fine. I have this fixed patterns <laughs> in which I can work from. So most of your, I guess you could say your pro, uh, your projects are based off of the, like you said, location or camera and kind of like that structure that you have. And then you just photograph um, whatever's out there after that. Yeah, because that, I mean, the, the theory that I the theory or the logical structure of that is the, the, the location and the setup will determine what you can do with that. Like it's directly oh, that's right. connected. Yeah. That's if you right. have like a wide angle lens and you're taking pictures in, you know, New York, there's a certain kind of pictures you can craft and that's, right. and that's yeah. it. So that will yeah. determine the content. Like you don't need to curate the content beforehand. If you think I'm going to take pictures of people up close, then I'm going to decide a lens. It's another logical structure that this is the lens I want to use. Therefore, it will dictate what I can do. That's interesting. That's a very interesting uh, way to think of it like that. Like most of the time when I hear people talking about, you know, kind of the subject matter that they choose for a project, it's always this is kind of the theme that I'm going to photograph for. And then they photograph. Yeah. I've no, never I... seen it the other way around. You know, that's that's really cool. Though. Yeah, I can't I can't think of themes or like. But also because that's how I work when I write. I never write a play like I'm going to write a play about, you know, abandonment or how bad capitalism is. Because, sure, those things are there, but I arrive to those things from other places. Like, oh, I'm going to use three characters in this context. Okay, that context and those characters automatically already contain certain topics. Like, yeah, they will contain them. There's no other way. So you can almost see traces of your other like processes with writing and you know making plays they all kind of uh leave traces of that in your own photographic process yeah yeah that's awesome that's very unique because yeah i mean it's 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 whatever you consume dictates in a way what you're able to produce later on so yeah if if you are if if you want to be a writer and you don't read probably the, the, the things that you can write are not very interesting. And by the same token, if you want to be like, I don't know, if you want to write novels of adventures and you only read adventure novels, then your scope is going to be super limited because you're inside a certain format. If you want to take That's pictures right. of the street and you only follow street photography accounts, then probably your account for that is going to be super narrow because yeah. we all share the same things. But the gestures yeah. do not... Yeah, you know, we can think that just because something has become a code, it means that it's true. And that's very hard for the mind because we navigate through codes that we think are, you know, objective or certain. So we tend yeah. to think, oh, the way of taking pictures is this way because I see it everywhere. So we all know that this is common knowledge. We all know how this works. But if you want to take pictures of the street and at the same time you follow, I don't know, fashion photography accounts or you follow mm -hmm. like whatever, you start thinking, oh, you know, there's a really interesting way of thinking about light or color by this person from this area that I'm not taking into account. Maybe I can use it. And then you just grab bits of different Pieces. perspectives. Just to kind of finish off on your creative, your creative process for photography, you know, what's one thing that you can, one thing that you want to say to 
somebody who's doing street photography now or who wants to maybe start shooting street photography soon uh you know what's one piece of advice that you can give to them that you know if you if you were to narrow it down from all of the different uh detours and sub you know messages that you have into one line what would that be it's it's a composed answer so i'm gonna make a trick but yeah i think self-observation is the most important thing self-observation and why is that because if you observe yourself while making something you can discover am i lying Where, where where did i take this from or am i being myself while i'm doing this or am i imitating somebody or am I presenting myself in a way that is not honest? Am I pretending to be somebody else? Am I like this in real life? When I connect with somebody on the street, like if I meet somebody, am I being me or am I being like a projection of me that wants something from this other person? Yeah. Like my yeah. goal, yeah, I will say one of my goals or probably my goal in life is to be me all the freaking time. So if you meet me now and we chat, when we stop recording this, I'm going to still be me like this. And if we meet in person, it's going to be me again. Like the, the, <laughs> It's just me. There's, there's no separation between a character and myself or how I present myself to be. Like this guy who's right now, I am like this in Colombia. I am like this when I'm at lunch with my family. I am like this with my friends. But that is through self-observation. I'm always wondering, am I myself? Am I doing this? Is this honest? Where do I get this from? Like I'm taking this picture. Do I really want to take it? So I think self-observation in regards of self-skepticism is the Mm -hmm. most healthy way of proceeding for me. That's really interesting because sometimes I do take inspiration from maybe people on Instagram or from like, you know, just looking at like photo books or something like that. Mm. But I never do really ask myself like, okay, you know, am, am I really photographing this for what I like to photograph or am I doing this as kind of part of... I seen that and I like what it looked like. Maybe let me mm. try to emulate it, you know? So that's really interesting, dude. Yeah, and, the, and the, the underlying layer of that is I like this thing. Why do I like it? Because once you can pinpoint oh. why do you like it, you can tell I like it because it has this and this and this property. And if you can like determine specifically which property, you can work on that property instead of crafting the yeah. whole image. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> subdivide, <laughs> man. You gotta subdivide. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ed, man, thank you for taking time out of your day to record it. Happy Easter, by the way. Maybe I should have said that first. Ah, uh, that's all right. Uh, I just, I'm so atheist yeah. that I, I can't. I can't. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. It is whatever. It's a nice day. day. I love it. Everybody can celebrate yeah. whatever they want. It's a beautiful Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> Well, dude, thank you again. I hope to meet you one day if I ever come out to New York, make a yeah, video sure, or something man. like that. Hit me up whenever you're in the city, man. Heck yeah. Big fan of your uh, what everything that you're doing, man. So good luck thank with you, uh, submitting your thesis and uh, everything that <laughs> everything that comes through for your life, man. <laughs> thank you. All Thanks right, a dude. lot, man. Thanks for having me. And yeah, just picks of luck and let me know whenever you're in the city or you want to do something. Let's do it. All right, bro. See you later. See you later.